The following program is an original production of WICC PBS Chicago. The new school year is just days away with new concerns about safety after the closing of 47 Chicago public schools. Worries tonight about the danger kids face walking to school and the program designed to protect them. A backlash is brewing over Governor Quinn's decision to stop the pay of Illinois lawmakers. His fellow Democrats are fighting the governor in court. Plus, the elite sport of rowing is gaining ground in the inner city, how it's changing lives here in Chicago. These stories and much more tonight on In the Loop. I'm Chris Bury. And I'm Barbara Pinto. Tonight we take an in-depth look at the restructuring of Chicago's public schools, a mass closing designed to save money, but at what cost? Chicago students head back to class next week, but many of them are headed to new schools because their old ones have been closed, and now their way to school could lead through dangerous, gang-dominated neighborhoods. CPS has put together an intricate safe passage plan to keep kids out of harm's way. But will it work? Those on the front lines are cautiously optimistic. So we are one united Alex Haley. One united Alex Haley. And that's what we are and that's what we will be for the rest of our school day. High hopes going into the new school year at Alex Haley Academy, an elementary school on the far south side Roseland neighborhood. Haley is the designated receiving school for the now closed West Pullman School just a few blocks away. This past June, West Pullman was one of 47 elementary schools, mainly on the south and west sides of the city, closed by CPS in an effort to save the district $560 million over the next decade. That decision sparked huge protests by angry parents and teachers. The principal at Haley has been working hard to bring students and teachers from both schools together. We started off on really good terms. Um, we've developed a friendship over this year. Our teachers did a lot of collaboration and working well with one another. And I think that set the tone. Principal Rhonda Larkin has few concerns about safety inside the school, but she's worried about outside. West Pullman students will now have to make their way to Haley, walking through a hornet's nest, turf controlled by at least eight rival gangs. Bob Jackson is executive director of Ceasefire in Roseland. His group has been hired by CPS to patrol a designated safe passage route that runs straight through the middle of gang territory. You got the BDs, GDs, four corner hustlers, little fractions of the Stones and some other um, gangs. And then you got the Yale Street boys, uh, the Straight Street uh, boys, and then you have the nine. A map in Jackson's office vividly illustrates the danger. Each circle represents a recent shooting or homicide. Despite this daunting picture, he's optimistic. We all are going to pull together and we're going to make this work. For nothing else to say that we didn't lose no kids throughout our year. That's our goal, to make sure no kid gets shot or killed during this period. During a back to school party at Haley designed to bring the community together, some parents expressed concerns about combining kids from two different schools. We don't know, you know, how the other kids, you know, were at their old schools, you know, bad or good. We don't, we don't know. Janice Adams has a six year old son at Haley who was excited at the opportunity to meet new friends. Audrey Donson cares for her niece and nephew, both now headed to Haley. She's worried about the changes and wonders if the safe passage routes will truly be safe. That is a, a, a scary feeling when your child has to walk eight blocks or an adult because they, they might attack an adult too. Bob Jackson believes in order for this to work, the entire community has to be on board with a safe passage program. He sees it as a small component of a larger mission to end violence in Roseland. Okay, it's not just me, it's all these residents. It's time for them to come out of their houses, come out and be a part of something, part of history. Because we make this work, it can work all over the United States. 
The Chicago Public School Safe Passage program began in 2009 after the beating death of Fenger High School student Darian Albert. Video of his, of his fatal beating went viral on YouTube and prompted federal action. Now with the closing of 47 elementary schools, the CPS is spending nearly $8 million to expand that program, hiring 600 workers to shepherd school children to class through the city's most dangerous neighborhoods. Chicago Tribune education reporter Noreen Ahmed Ola has been following CPS in the Safe Passage program and she joins us today. Noreen, welcome. Thanks for having me. There are always jitters on the first day of school, but this year even more so. We have 13,000 students, CPS, elementary school students, who will go to new schools after their schools are closed. Now we saw in that video piece the map that was daunting gangs in such close proximity in those neighborhoods take us into the lives of these kids and what they'll be facing when they go to school Monday morning. So the vast majority of the school closings that happened, um, so there were actually 49 that were 49 elementary schools that were approved for closing this year. 47 of them were closed in June. And the vast majority of those are in really, really rough neighborhoods in the city on the south and the west sides. So that example that you have of Haley, you know, the walk from West Palm into Haley, going through eight or nine different gang territories, that's repeated throughout most of the city. Um, I was in Englewood yesterday um, between two different schools, um, a closing school and a receiving school there. And in that one, the parents in the neighborhood told me that there's about four different gangs that, that their kids will be walking through, four different gang territories. Um, in West Pullman and Haley's case, there's an added, you know, issue. There's been long-standing rivalry between those schools. So the kids from West Pullman dislike the students from Haley, and the students from Haley dislike the students from West Pullman because they're rival gangs, and they have been for years. There's been lots of revenge killings back and forth, and there's a bunch of schools that are, you know, paired in this way. West Pullman and Haley isn't the only one. So you've got safe passage issue, you've got really rough neighborhoods that these kids are walking through. Added on to that, you've got this other safety component where there's schools that are rival gangs. Now, you've been speaking with parents and teachers and administrators. How concerned are they at this point in the year? Yeah, so everybody's just sort of holding their breath and, you know, they, 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 if you talk to school officials, they say that they've done everything that they can and they feel like, you know, everything's on target. But when you talk to parents, they're, a lot of them are planning on walking their kids along the safe passage routes. Um, they don't feel comfortable enough to just let their kids go on those routes on their own. So it's sort of like a wait and see approach, see if it's actually working. Um, some parents are just planning on driving because again, if you're walking, even if, you're, if you've got safe passage escorts, a lot of parents don't feel comfortable with their kids taking those routes. Now, the CPS has brought in 600 extra safe passage workers. They're asking people from Streets and Sand and police and firefighters also to kind of be on board with this program. But the majority of these workers will be armed only with a cell phone to call 911 for help. How great is the concern that that may not be enough? Right, so the gang experts in the city and the parents, again, if you talk to them, this is one of the reasons why they're walking their kids to schools themselves or they're driving them. Um, and even if they're taking the safe passage route, they're planning on being there with them because the main concern is that, you know, a bullet's not going to stop, I mean, a safe passage is not going to stop a bullet from flying at a kid. Wow. And, and how about the, um, the schools you mentioned, rival gangs inhabiting the same school? How are these principals prepared to deal with this? So they've tried different mechanisms. Um, they've basically, you know, the district has put all of these receiving schools through various social emotional learning uh, programs and a lot of them are instituting um, programs that will help in terms of conflicts within the school. So for example, in Haley's case, which is getting the rival school, West Pullman, they're planning in that first week with their middle school kids to do a lot of anti-bullying programs. Um, and they're going to be mostly incorporated in team building exercises. So it's, it's not really anti-bullying per se, it's more team building exercises, but they're hoping that that will help the kids bond. But you know, like I said, I've been following these two schools since April. And um, when I was at, at that jam last Friday, I, you know, I still heard from Haley kids who were not happy with the idea that West Pullman kids were coming into their school. And at one point, you know, I asked a bunch of kids, you know, if you see a West Pullman kid getting bullied, are you going to stand up for him? And the vast majority of them said no. Mm. There was one kid who had actually gone through some sort of leadership training within Haley. He was the only one that stood up and said, no, I'm actually going to stand up for the West Pullman kid. Mm. So they've got, a, they've got a great deal of work uh, cut out for them. It sounds like, I mean, clearly a lot of, is at stake here, mm -hmm. uh, the future of children. But there's also, there are also political stakes here. What is at stake politically 
for the mayor and for the school superintendent? Right, so the mayor has you know, been on the record as saying that you know, if you were to look at gang issues, you know, none of these school closings could have happened, that this is just the reality in the city, that kids are walking through various rival gangs to get to school, and this has always been occurring. So what they've done is they've put the Safe Passage Plan in place to give parents the security that they need to actually move their kids to the new locations. Um, so the mayor, you know, th there's a lot at stake politically. I mean, everybody's watching this. Um, there's, you know, kids' lives that are at stake here, but there's also a lot of promises that CPS has made that, you know, kids who are actually going to the new schools will actually improve academically. So we'll be watching in the years ahead whether the safety promise was kept, whether the academic promise was kept. Um, there's a lot riding on it, and this is probably the major reform initiative of Mayor Rahm Emanuel and his administration. Add this to budget cuts that have taken millions out of the classroom for this year. Right, so you know, while the closings have hit the south and west sides largely, the budget cuts have actually hit a lot of north side schools. Um, you know, anywhere from schools have seen anywhere from like a hundred thousand dollar budget cuts to even a million dollars for some high schools, and that's meant loss of a lot of teachers. Um, schools are still scrambling at the last minute trying to figure out their programming. All right, we have a lot to keep our eye on. We have homework to do in watching this <laughs> this school year. Noreen, thank you for sharing your sure. time with us. We thank appreciate you. it. Now, Illinois lawmakers aren't getting paid, and they aren't happy. Here's Chris with more. The never-ending pension reform mess leads to a halt in pay and now a lawsuit, plus faster cars on Illinois highways and bulls running loose in suburban Chicago. These are among the stories that are trending tonight. Until the job is done, uh, I don't think the legislators should be paid. In an unprecedented move, Governor Quinn halts the pay of state lawmakers. The pension crisis has been something that's been an 800-pound gorilla for them. There's no reason for us not to be getting paid. Now Democrats say, show us the money and sue the governor to get their paychecks back. Leadfoots rejoice, but will the state's new 70-mile-an-hour limit reach Chicago's roadways? I think 70 miles an hour is probably what they're already doing. But some Chicagoans hit the brakes hoping the new speed limit stays on the interstates and tollways. 70 is kind of pushing it. The bulls are charging into the Windy City, and we're not talking about those bulls. I want to do it. I definitely want to do it. I want to sign up for it. More than 1,000 people have registered for the U.S. version of the running of the bulls. I can't believe they would even bring it here. It's completely barbaric. <laughs> And we will get to those bulls in just a moment. Joining us tonight, Angel Garcia, president of the Chicago Young Republicans, Mitzi Miller, editor-in-chief of Jet Magazine, and journalist and author, Walter Jacobson. Welcome. So Governor Quinn is taking a new tough tack. Walter, what do you make of this? I think he's taking a political tack, which makes a lot of sense, of course, because the public, according to public opinion polls, are in favor of punishing the members of the assembly who are not making any progress on the pension problem. You know, a billion dollars in debt, hundreds of millions of dollars every day being lost, and they're in Springfield still fiddling around and not getting anywhere, we think. We haven't heard how far this commission that is deciding what to do is proceeding. But from everything I can hear and see, it's just going nowhere. And it's because of the politics. You know, all they're thinking about down there, which is what they usually think about, is the upcoming election. And the Republicans are trying to embarrass Quinn, and Quinn is trying to embarrass Daly and the Republicans. And we will suffer the consequences of politicizing all the important events. And this, Simple as that. And this toughness, Mitzi, from Governor Quinn is kind of uncharacteristic for him. Okay. And do you think this is a, a PR stunt, or is, is this actually a good tool to get the legislators to do something about the pension mess? You know, I think whether it's a PR stunt or a good tool, I think this is what the voters want to see. At the end of the day, if the average person doesn't work, you don't get paid. So the frustration is built up, and this is a way for everybody being called to the table. Either you come and you put in the work and you earn your check, or continue to do what you're doing and don't get paid. Angel Garcia, you're a Republican. You must be kind of salivating over this spectacle. Well, this is great because we see a Democrat on Democrat, you know, uh, suing <laughs> right. each other. Uh, but no, I think this shows uh, Quinn's failed leadership because now Democrats and Republicans don't want to give him a political victory, right? If anything does pass, now Quinn can take the mantle and say, look what I've done. 
I'm a great leader. And we're going into campaign season. Um, Mike Madigan, some Democrats will not want to give him a victory. Uh, so actually, it's pushing any chance for pension reform back. Uh, but politically, uh, give the devil his due. It's been very well received. Uh, and the voters I talk to, they think it's great. So a politically great victory as far as getting any real issues done, a uh, huge failure. And now you've got the Democrats, the Democratic leadership, Madigan and Cullerton, going to court to get them, <laughs> to get the, the court to decide that they should be paid. Democrats taking their own Democratic governor to court. Yeah, and the next hearing in court isn't until the middle of September, so they're going to lose their pay for the month of September, which will be the second month in a row. But don't feel sorry for them. Yeah. They're, they're earning, or not earning, they're being paid $68,000 a year each, plus $100 a year a day in per diem expenses well, and a lot of them don't on. a lot of them have two jobs anyway they're there just a short period of time charging us for lightening up the assembly i mean with the electrical lights and doing all the work and the, but if we shouldn't feel sorry for them should we feel sorry for the for the taxpayers because even this lawsuit is being funded with state money which is taxpayer money well i think Everyone loses. It's no, there's no big winner here. But at the end of the day, as, as a taxpayer, I'd much rather see my money go towards a holdout than see it go towards people sitting around doing a whole lot of nothing and posturing and refusing to come together and be adults. This pe pension situation is very serious. And the longer they idle, the longer they play the ego game, who can hold out more, who has, you know, ultimately it's on our backs. So for me, I'm for it. They, don't pay them. And Angel, you were mentioning the, the politics of this before. Is this the driving issue going into the governor's race next year? Oh, I think it definitely is. And I think Quinn is smart politically and mm -hmm. is making it the issue. He's uh, framed the issue so great now. He's saying, look, the legislators aren't getting it done, so I did the only thing I could do. I stopped them from getting paid. Now, again, I think that's a political stunt because behind the scenes, people are not mad and not, don't want to give them the victory, Democrats and Republicans. Uh, something they should have worked on, you know, years ago. Uh, you know, Mike Maddox has been in charge for 30 years, and this is a huge thing that's been building up for 30 years. But no, Quinn is framing the issue. He's framed it early, and I think uh, we'll see if that works. And I think it is the number one issue out there. The other thing about Quinn in the news uh, this week, he signed a new law authorizing a 70-mile-an-hour speed limit over much of Illinois, and some confusion about whether it applies to Chicago or not. Walter, the idea of a 70 mile an hour speed limit. How about the politics of that one? <laughs> Pat Quinn needs support. Pat Quinn needs to be liked. Pat Quinn is always being criticized dramatically by the media. So he stands forward on an issue that a lot of people really care about. I don't understand why, why we have to be able to ride 70 miles an hour, and nobody follows the speed limit anyway. So they're going to be, we all will be going 75 or 80 miles an hour, and all the traffic control people and the, uh, and the uh, what's the name of the? Uh, the state police? The state police. The state police <laughs> and the motor club. They're all saying that it's dangerous, and it is dangerous. So what, what is the purpose? And apparently there's a lot of confusion about whether or not it will apply to urban areas. Mitzi, what about it in Chicago? Does it make any sense? You know, on something like Lakeshore Drive, I honestly think it makes sense. It's a Lakeshore Drive. I mean, not well, Lakeshore Drive. Yeah, even Lakeshore Drive is there's it's three lanes, three four lanes at times. It makes sense to me. I'm what you might call an aggressive driver. <laughs> I like I like getting where I'm going. Um, but no, I don't want to see it on Michigan Avenue. No, I wouldn't want to see it on 13th Street. But <laughs> where there's no pedestrian traffic. If people, like you said, are doing it anyway, we're also a lot of, there's accidents caused when people are trying to slow down quickly because they see a cop on the side of the road. They're trying to beat a ticket and not thinking about the other drivers on the road. And ultimately, I know this may sound a little cavalier, but there's always the right lane. There's always the right lane. If you are uncomfortable with the speed limit, if you want to go at the speed limit or even below it, there's always the right lane. Why do you need it? You always in a hurry? <laughs> I, I, you know, listen, I, some of us are busier. Some of us just like to drive. I like my car. <laughs> Angel, what about it? Should there be separate rules for the city and the suburbs and downstate? Does it just make common sense? Well, it's down to how the bill is written. And I think Jim Oberts, one of the sponsors, he says that applies to the entire state. And I think it makes sense. Um, you know, 70 mile an hour, maybe not the biggest thing in front of uh, the voters. But I think uh, we want to be in line with other states. I think it makes sense. Uh, and quite frankly, I think um, we need it. I'd like to save, uh, I'd like to drive aggressively and uh, no harm, no foul.
The other part wow. of this, apparently, <laughs> that Quinn got is that he is changing the amount at which you're going to be charged for excessive speeding. Mm -hmm. That's going to go down to right. 26 miles an hour right. from 31 miles an hour. Does that make it more palatable, Walter? It certainly doesn't make it palatable to me. I can't understand why uh, people are so impatient, especially when it uh, involves possibly <laughs> a dangerous accident. It just doesn't make any sense. And I guess a lot of people, like Mitzi, like to, and Angel, want to have it happen, and that's what Quinn understands, and that's why he's doing what he's doing. But to have that speed limit through the heart of Chicago? No. I think we have to remind Mitzi that at the speed limit on Lakeshore Drive, I believe, is 45. Right. I don't think it is. And, well, the legal, but when you're driving <laughs> there, the, I mean, the people driving alongside me are clearly not doing 45 at all. And a lot of times, I've been in cabs that are not doing 45. So it, if you, I think it balances slightly by decreasing the, the amount that you can go over before you qualify for you know, a serious ticket. Um, Angel, for the average driver, though, is it confusing? Because it sounds like there are going to be multiple speed limits depending on where one is. Yeah, if, if it's as Quinn is saying it should be, which is uh, around Chicago, it doesn't change in uh, south of I-80, it goes up to 70. Well, of course, people that live near there will be confused. They, well, I heard it was 70 miles an hour. What's going on? So I think right. it could be confusing. Uh, but I think the bill as it is, as it was written by uh, Jim Oberweiss and Christine Rodonio, um, if it affects the whole state, I think we'll be fine. Obviously, there's times during the day, we all know, uh, during rush hour, where even if it's not 70 miles an hour, we're going to be going five miles an hour. So that's not going <laughs> to right. change. Uh, but at times of the day where there's no traffic, I think uh, it's a good law. And I think the fact that the top level for a ticket is reduced, mitigates it, and makes a more palatable bill that everyone can get behind. Isn't the issue going to wind up being local control or statewide control? It, it, it is. It, it's, it, it's up to the counties, right? right? And they're in the position of not having ever done this before. It's so like, it, it's, it's like going to be confusing. It's like concealed carry, too. You know, we don't want to have it in Chicago, or the mayor doesn't want to have it in Chicago. Let it happen in downstate counties where there's not as much population, there's not as much danger. The same was true with the speed. Let, let the local communities determine what it will be in each community. And, and, and while we're talking about speed, let's go quickly out to Hawthorne Racetrack, where next year they're planning the running of the bulls. And uh, we're talking about the Pamplona, Spain kind of running of the bulls. The first one is going to happen this week weekend in uh, near Richmond, Virginia. But the, the running of the bulls is, is coming to Chicago. And uh, Angel, let's start with you. What do you think about that? Oh, I think it's great. I think uh, risk takers have a chance to get out there and, and run. And, uh, but, you know, we'll have to see how it is. I find it hard to believe it will be even close to how it is in Spain. In Spain, we see people getting hurt, people dying. Fifteen uh, people have been killed by bulls in Spain since this started. I have, I have a feeling with the litigation we have in America uh, <laughs> right. that it's going to be far tamer and uh, we're going to have people running, jogging through, and then after they finish, maybe a bull will come by. Uh, I do find it hard to believe that will be anywhere near as risky as what we have in Spain. Let me just read you what the Humane Society is, is saying about this. This is the executive director. These events are a shameful example of cruelty for the sake of nothing more than entertainment and profit. Mitzi, what about that? Unfortunately, as Americans, we do a lot of that. Um, I, you know, I'm on the fence about it personally. I'm not partaking. I'm, I don't, I'm not a thrill seeker. And, you know, I was raised to believe it's all fun and games till somebody loses an eye, or in this case, all your organs. Um, we, we just as a country, we love this kind of thing. We love taking things over the top. So when it's done one time is when we'll see. But I agree. They, they've said that they're not going to bring the same type of aggressive bulls. And they're not going to kill the bulls as right. they do in Pamplona. Exactly. Walter, and they are going to have a tomato fight at the end of it. <laughs> right. The tomato fight makes everything Pamplona. better. Right. Right. Exactly. So let's give you the last word on that, Walter. What do I, you don't, think? I don't like the idea, but I'm concerned about government making decisions for us that may we may disagree with. So if people want to do it, I guess they ought to be able to do it. But... I agree with the Humane Society. Cruelty for the sake only of profit and entertainment. Not good. I just want to see the Chicago Bulls <laughs> run well with Derek Rose this fall. Angel Garcia, Mitzi Miller, and Walter Jacobson, thank you for being here and sharing your thoughts. We appreciate it. There's something unique happening on the Chicago River. Look closely along the south end of the river, and you'll see inner city kids getting a chance to do something they never dreamed they could. Overhead! Ready up! Rowing, 
long considered an elite sport, but here in Chicago, young people don't have to come from a privileged background to be part of a sport not commonly taught to inner city kids. We happen to be the largest inner city, fully free competitive rowing team in the country. That's taken six years to achieve, but these kids could be anywhere but here, but yet they choose to come to practice. More than 60 boys and girls from across the city are members of a competitive rowing team sponsored by the Chicago Training Center. Montana Bush, a former Oxford University rower, started the program. Now he's launching dreams, one stroke at a time. Game on, let's go. On the face of it, Chicago Training Center is a rowing team. It's a competitive rowing team with a competitive team structure that looks to compete in races and win medals. Since 2007, the year-round rowing program has attracted more than 160 teenagers from some of Chicago's poorest and toughest neighborhoods. They come all from the south and west side, mainly Pilsen, back of the yards, some Bridgeport areas, uh, some closer to Gage Park and uh, Inglewood area. Many of them are first-time college aspirants. Isaac Sanchez is your typical team member. He comes from an immigrant family. His father never graduated from high school, unlike Isaac. He recently graduated from Uno Charter High School on Chicago's south side. The oldest of two children from a close-knit family, Isaac credits the training center for doing more than teaching him how to row. It's pretty amazing that I get to do something that an average kid doesn't do. It's a lot more competitive. It's just something that I could see myself doing for the rest of my life. Here's a kid that you know, had probably minimal expectations entering high school about where he was going to go to college and what path he would take. He was a leader for our team this year and it was a very highly competitive boat and he's looking now to extend his career to the University of Illinois where he's going to come in as probably their most accomplished freshman rower. The rowing team offers a positive outlet for kids faced with the challenges of inner city life, but sometimes even this temporary respite is not enough to protect them. Columbia College student Kevin Ambrose had a heart of gold and a bright future, according to one teacher. But tonight, he is the latest victim of gun violence on the streets of Chicago. Former team member Kevin Ambrose was shot to death on the way to the train. It was a case of mistaken identity. What happened to Kevin is nothing more than providing us with you know, all the information, all the motivation we need to continue what we're doing in the event that not only can we find more Kevins, but we can find people like the shooter and get them involved in the program before that ever happens. So Montana rose on, never losing focus on his journey and keeping his eye on the finish line. In my mind, it's, I'm doing the thing I should be doing. For me, rowing at Oxford and being from Chicago, it meant that coming back, I felt in some ways required to give back to the community and then give the sport to those kids that just didn't have the opportunity to do it. And what a way to give back. That's it for us. You are now in the loop. The conversation continues right now on WYCC.org. I'm Barbara Pinto. And I'm Chris Bury. Until next week, good night.